All right, guys. So welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show. We're your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. And obviously in our show, we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We have a very interesting guest today, Scott Myers out of Indianapolis, and he does self-storage, something that we've talked about for years yeah. and don't know a lot about. We obviously, we specialize in um, you know residential real estate. That's what we've done and kind of built our, our name on, but I always love the idea of not having tenants. We've got about 40 actual single family and multifamily rentals, so we kind of know about that. So I'm looking forward to talking to Scott today and learning more about what he does and all that kind of good good stuff. So welcome to the call, Scott. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah, you too. So tell us about you. Tell our audience kind of about you and what you, I think you started kind of where we started, <clears throat> right, in residential. And I'm kind of curious your your journey. Take us through that. Sure. So, uh, yeah, like most folks that get started in uh, real estate investing, started out with uh, single family houses. So I bought the uh, the Carlton Sheets home study uh, program. Oh, yeah, uh, we did too. Those are museum worthy now, I think. They uh, are. Yeah, <laughs> just passed away. I saw. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that, that was the model that I began to, to follow was uh, buy a house, uh, fix it up, refinance it, pull out money to go then buy two more and then um, put a renter in it, get a hundred, $175 uh, a, a month in positive cash flow. I think his model is 175 to 225. He said, you're doing well. And we were right in there. And so then we just continued to do that uh, moving forward. And, and, you know, things were going well. Started to do lease options uh, on those uh, as well, so that um, obviously we move them in, the house is rehabbed, uh, they handle any of the, the repairs uh, in theory. But what then we found is that uh, a renter is a renter is a renter, even if we help them along the way, try to get them financing and use their uh, a portion of their payments as a down payment. They, you know, not as many people would actually buy the house as we had hoped for. So they, we get them back and after rehab again. I say it's like 90. 95%, 98% never go through and actually buy the house, right? When you do it, so the lease yeah. option for those listening, a lease option is mm -hmm. you're saying that you would sell the house to an end buyer as if mm -hmm. they could lease it with the option to buy. Correct. And and we set our our, our lease up that um, they handled all the maintenance, you know, since it, you yep. know, we gave them a beautiful house and said, hey, this, you know, we're grooming you for home ownership and part of home ownership is taking care of it. And we've done everything, you know, because we would gut them, take the roof off, you know, rip out the kitchens and the baths and everything was new. And so, um, you know, again, in theory, that's uh, that's what we thought, and, and you're right. Those those are our same numbers. We got them back, and so we have to do it. You know, a partial rehab on them uh, again, and and that really wasn't our model. We wanted to keep some rentals, but we did want to flip some. So, well, we didn't have the uh, uh, the cash flow and the freedom like Carlton had stated in his home study system. <laughs> so we thought, Takes a lot of houses, right? <laughs> yeah. So we'll um we'll nip this in the bud by uh, doubling down, and economies of scale will fix this. And so we started getting into multifamily. So we started buying um, apartment complexes around central Indiana. And okay. uh, before we knew it, we had uh, about 425 units that we were managing both houses and uh, apartments. And you know, on that end, well, once again, that just all they did was really multiply our problems. I mean, they're still, you know, there's that critical mass and that point, even if we have property management companies where we're still involved and, you know, until you really get the mortgages paid off or, or down and refinance, you know, you, you really need to slug it out. And, and it just wasn't providing for what we wanted, you know, the cash flow and the life that we wanted. And, and that was really to just have a little more passive income. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, without just throwing in the towel on real estate, I mean, for all the reasons we love real estate. I was not going to go back and work for somebody else. I can't, you know, once you go out on your own, as you guys know, that's, you know, you're, that's it. You, <laughs> you become know. unhirable. Yeah. Yeah. My, fr my friend tells me, he said, you, you never, you, you couldn't work for anybody. I go, I don't want to. I worked myself since I was 19. He, he laughs and says, you wouldn't make it to the interview. The first call you wouldn't make it through. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> so I know what you mean. Going back to uh, working for my boss and then a sales meeting and saying, uh, so Scott, what did you do last week? And what are you going to do this week? And I'd be like, Pfft. My mother, I'd be right. do whatever I want. <laughs> what you, yeah, mother? you suddenly oh. become unhirable. <laughs> exactly. That's so so, uh, so we, we, we begin looking around, um, you know, in the, in the landscape in real estate. And, you know, uh, if it weren't for the tenants in the toilets, <laughs> everybody loves real estate, right? <laughs> And That's so sure. you know, that leaves parking lots and, and self storage. And then, um, you know, you can't really build value in a parking lot. And that's, you know, you know, we're, we're, we have the same business model. You know, we build value. We buy the, the fixer uppers, the junkers, and you know, we create value in it uh, by rehabbing. And so that only left self storage. And so I began looking into it and didn't know much about it. And then uh, what I found just, you know, really, really kind of shocked me. And, and that is uh, this, you know, the, the Cinderella of the commercial real estate industry in this uh, little corner of, of real estate in general that is you know, quite honestly the most profitable. And, and that's not, that wasn't just me being biased now that I'm in it. Uh, when I begin to, to peel back the onion and look at the numbers, you know, self-storage has outperformed all other real estate asset classes and it has for more than 35 years. It's, it's yeah. inflation proof, it's a recession proof. When people don't pay, 
you lock them out and you sell their stuff. I mean, you know, imagine that, you know, versus going through, you know, eviction court where all the laws are set up to protect the tenant instead of oh, that they know, are. the, the yeah. big bad business owner. Yeah. And when somebody moves out, um, we take a gas blower and we blow it out in 30 seconds and we move in the next person waiting in line because we're in markets that have high barriers to entry and and uh, have high demand. And so, you know, when it, the more I looked at it, I, I thought, okay, this is this is really uh, m worth looking into. And so once we did, we started buying them, sold off our houses uh, and our apartments. Uh, we only own one house. It's the one that I'm in uh, right now. Nice, okay. And that's it. So uh, then we continued to um, you know, grow the business. And uh, I used to run the uh, Indianapolis Landlords Association. We had uh, about 600 members here at that time. And I started holding some workshops and then began teaching people about the business. And one of the agents for all the speakers on the national circuit said, hey, we need somebody who uh, can go out and teach about this. We got a lot of real estate groups that are looking for somebody that can uh, teach on it. So I'll tell you what, I'll help you uh, create a home study system and put you out on the road and and, and you can go out and, and, and speak on it if you'd like. And I said, that'd be great because as the president, I used to write those checks to those guys that would come in and speak for <laughs> yeah, you. Knew. And... <laughs> yeah, you knew the speaking speaking gets a lot of money for good at it, yeah. 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 So, um, so then we began doing that and, um, and that was fun. I thought, you know, I thought it was a good vacation money. And then, uh, then it took on a life of its own and then, you know, all the demands came in and, you know, I found myself, um, with two 60 hour a week businesses. Um, and, and so something had to give after doing that for a few years. And, um, as we talked, um, you know, off camera before this, um, you know, young kiddos at the time didn't want to miss out on, on, on them growing up. And so understand. We, we, we really, um, you know, mm -hmm. the education side of the business, uh, kind of take a back seat. And uh, only, you know, hold very few events, very select events, and we only work with a consult or mentor with a select few individuals. And, and the, a big component of that is then partnering with them. Sure. So, you know, we didn't want to have a big education company where nobody does anything and then it just becomes a customer service, you know, nightmare. We, we truly, if we're going to teach people, you know, we'll open up the kimono and show them everything that we've done in our business plan and, and access to our resources. They go out and do it. And then we partner with them and we bring syndicated funds. Uh, we have a, a, a large group of uh, private equity investors that invest in our projects that are looking for more. And so if we thought we can teach people to do it exactly the way that we're doing and a partner with them, then our equity partners, our investors would partner on those projects because we're in them and okay. that would allow us to do more. And so that's, uh, that's the place that we find ourselves now doing more deals and getting involved in a lot of uh, development deals and conversions in the past uh, several years. And, now we've cracked the two million square foot mark and over 13,000 units nationwide. And um, it has, uh, without us really knowing it um, until we kind of took a step back, we've cracked the top 50 in terms of owners in the country. Uh, oh, recently. good for you. Congratulations. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't that's know awesome. if there's anything that we were really shooting for. I thought at one point that a million square feet would be, be enough. And then we uh, yeah, we lifted our head and took a look and um, I got to a, to a decent size that allows us to do some pretty cool things now. So really, uh, we're not looking to grow. What's that? No, you say something. Go ahead. No, I was just saying. So you said something early on that was interesting to me. You said you add value. So you know, I, some people think of storage. Even sometimes I do. Like, okay, I'm gonna buy a unit. Does it cash flow? And if I, you know, I think of it like a house, right? Like I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna finance this. And if I finance it, will my debt be covered by the income? And is there money there? Well, it, again, like like in small real estate transactions, it takes a while to have any cash flow. Right. We always teach it's a long-term play. We flip houses and wholesale to make cash flow while we're building wealth through exactly. real estate. But if your only model is to just do rentals, that would be very tough. Like you said, you have to slug it out. It's a great expression. Yeah. You have to slug it out. That's what it feels like some days, right? So mm -hmm. how do you, so you find, so what's an, what's an underperforming self-storage mm -hmm. unit look like? Like, is it yeah. run down? Is it, is it not managed well? Is I'm just curious what, and then how do you add value? Yeah, it's a, it's all that. I mean, it's a, it's no different. Distressed real estate is distressed real estate. You know it when you see it, you know, and you drive by a self-storage facility and the owner's taking their hands off the wheel. You know, there's weeds everywhere. The signs are faded. You know, it looks awful. There's no signage out front at all or marketing or any banners or anything, you know, that lets anybody know that they're managing anything. And if you happen to pull in and, you know, walk up to the door, there's a, you know, a handwritten piece of paper that says, you know, if you need anything, call this number. Oh, <laughs> you know, so okay. the mom and pops, you know, we started out with, with the mom and pops buying these, uh, what we call class C facilities. And then we would turn them around and, and create a class B facility out of it, taking it up a class. And so you do that by starting at the street, just like any other piece of real estate, you know, it's all about the curb appeal. Yeah. And, um, and then the office when people walk in and then having a, a person that actually is intelligent, you know, that has all their teeth and is wearing a professional shirt behind the counter, 
and, and, and then adding the technology on top of that as well. So we, we can rent these with kiosks. Um, we use you know, the website um, now to rent most of our units. I mean, they can they can perform the entire rental process and pay rent uh, online. And so, so you don't have to have a person in the in the in the unit. You have to have a person like in because a lot of times I'm thinking years ago when I had storage units, I had to go and there's a person that you know I pulled them employee, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, more employees and is that not the case anymore? We have a few unmanned facilities. Most of our facilities do have um, a, a manager on site, but their hours are dramatically reduced. So they're there at the beginning of the month when some people that do want to pay rent in person will come in. And then also on the weekends, which is the high volume of, uh, of rentals and some of those folks that do need some handholding. But we have facilities that are unmanned where the kiosk does the whole thing. You know, they, they, they punch in the, uh, the code to, um, to, to launch the, the program. It looks shows them a map of the facility. They pick what they want. The, the rates are on there, what will fit inside of it. They put the credit card in. When they're all done with the transaction, they sign on the screen, they get the rental agreement, either printed out or emailed to them. And we have a kiosk that dispenses those disc locks in case they've forgotten one of those as well. Wow, they get, they that's get into cool the facility. Stock. They go back to their individual unit, put the lock on it. And you know, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's like a red box. I mean, it's a very low level, yeah, uh, labor intensive type of transaction that allows us uh, to utilize technology. So, so um, one of the things that Glenn and I like to do at our workshops is is tell people the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, instead of just all of the upside. So, you know, we've heard you're making self storage sound amazing, mm -hmm. and and it sounds like it does have a lot of upsides. But what are some of the downsides to it? Yeah, none. There isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> Piece of cake. I never a problem. Uh, honestly, um, you know, we 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 do struggle with that, and I do the same thing as well. I'm an educator, and we teach people, and they'll say, hey, you know, you've been talking for two and a half days. You know, what you know, what's the catch? It's not all rosy and everything, and and, and we do have to stretch. But there, um, I well, once we get into the business, uh, well, first of all, my wife said we're partners as well. She goes after we sold our last apartment complex. She goes, hey, do you notice anything different today? And I goes. And that's always a loaded question when you know your husband gets asked. So, uh, your hair it looks that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> she said it's quiet. You know the phones aren't ringing. I was like, yeah, you're right. It is quiet. Um, but you know, in in the commercial realm, which is what um, self storage is, um, you know, five hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars buys a whole lot more units because it's just a metal box on a concrete slab versus an office unit or uh, an apartment unit. So there's um, there's many more units um, that we can we buy, um, and so one thinks that you know, okay, there, well, there's a whole lot to keep track of, and yes and no, except for the fact that once again technology takes care of that. Our property man our project uh, managers set up the the facility with a property management software that really kind of runs it and overlocks the units um, uh, for us because we have electronic locks on the units uh, now. So there there is more in order to uh, keep track of in terms of the amount of uh, tenants. Um, that is one piece. Really, the the biggest gotcha, um, and it's and it's such a rarity, is if you know we we do have the luxury of if somebody doesn't pay their rent, where we can overlock them. You know they can't get into the unit, and then if they haven't paid in 90 days, uh, the lien law state that we can sell their unit off. Well, every state has a law um, that states specifically here's when you send your cut lock notice, your your overlock notice, your I'm gonna sell your stuff notice, you know procedures. And, sure. and if you deviate from that at all, um, then they can come back and sue you for wrongful sale. Um, also, if you haven't kept track and done a good job or your manager didn't and you you um, sold unit 101 and it was actually the person in 201 that was behind, well, oops, <laughs> that could be a problem. And some sure. some of them have gotten in deep doo-doo over just not following that process. And so, quite honestly, that is really the biggest liability. You know, outside of that, you know, we we, we have to really create you know, uh, the what if scenarios, um, and they really aren't what ifs. It's just every business has risk. Somebody could slip and fall. Sure. Um, you know, we get cameras everywhere. So it's, you know, we, we've never run into anybody, you know, doing anything Ill, illegal or putting meth labs in because we don't have plumbing. I mean, you know, most of those problems occurred in our apartments and our houses. So strictly on the storage side, um, it's really just general business liability. You know, we, people can pilfer if you, if you accept cash, um, you got a manager that can pilfer and take off out of the top. You just got to keep an eye on that. You, you do your due diligence before you buy it to make sure that you you know the numbers that the seller and the broker gives you are correct. And then when you get into the facility, you check it again and and then you keep your eye on uh, you know on, on the business. You walk the four corners of it. It's not a hobby, and you just you know practice good basic business. But outside of that, there's nothing inherent in storage that is an additional risk that we have to keep uh, uh, you know aware of or any other gotchas um, that are you know specific to ours except for that lien law but again that's that, that's just yeah. kind of rare so I, I i'd love to you know I, i'm not blowing smoke and i have no reason to that's just 
we don't really have that uh, many inherent risks in the in the storage business. When you're when you first started, mm -hmm. what was the first unit you bought? Like how many units to, yeah. to give people kind of give our listeners some perspective on that? Is it yeah. 50, 100, 2, you know, I don't know what it is. What what's a what's sure. the storage facility sound like when you first started? It may not be fair and may not be typical for most folks to get into the business. It was a little bit larger, but it was a partnership. So, you know, we bought into we sent our mailers out. Okay. So just like we did with houses and apartments. Um the same kind of market. Sort of like you if you're ever looking to sell your facility, you know, send a ton of those out. And so we got a partner okay. um, that called back. They were getting a partnership divorce, and it was a it was a 400 unit facility, about 389 um, units, and um, it was a one. Let me see here, it was 978 thousand dollars. So this is back in 2005, 978 thousand dollars. And so again, a little bit bigger than than what most people would buy for the first one. Sure. Uh, but it appraised for 1.5 million. So we were able to get a very favorable loan. Both my partner and I uh, signed on the loan. Neither of us had self-storage experience. And so um, they wanted two guarantors and we both put some cash into the deal and uh, we got it at a good price It appraised even more. So that one was a little bit easier to get into. We had a, a, a buffer because it was already you know below value, but we did the same things that we're doing right now. Um, it, we turned around the management, you know, they didn't, they were in the concrete business. Um, they weren't in the self storage business. This is kind of an afterthought and they just continue to add on. Um, the gal behind the counter was good, but she was friends with everybody and nobody ever paid a late fee and nobody was, ever, uh, you know, yeah. you know, moved out by way of the auction process. Um, we raised rates cause they never wanted to, because they wanted to stay full. You know, we just love to stay full all the time. Yeah. So there was just a tremendous amount of upside just by managing it better. And keeping your eye on it, you know, seeing what the, the, the competitors are charging. We input, we put a kiosk in, reduce that gal's hours down from 40 to 25. And, and that's in commercial real estate. That's how you create value is, is the bottom line is increasing the bottom line because it's really valued based upon the income stream, the net operating income versus a comp like you have with houses where you improve it. And now it's up, you know, it's appraised at a higher value. Um, storage and commercial real estate, there's no limit. You know, the more money you make and, and the more you reduce your expenses, the higher the value of the facility is when it comes time to either refinance or sell it. Right. Do you think that your experience though in starting out in single family rentals and the income that you generated through that helped you get into self-storage? So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is self-storage a good route for a brand new investor that maybe doesn't have much to start with? Or do you think that that your journey would, would be a typical person to get into self-storage? Very, very good question. And, and again, we, we teach a lot of people about the business and 90% um, or more come to us with real estate experience. And, um, okay. and I think probably, probably like you, the folks that are drawn to you and come to your events and learn from you, you know, they're already doing what you're doing or looking to do that and, and they want to take it to the next level. You know, the, your story is their story. And so, you know, as we get out and begin teaching people, you know, the folks that, that were attracted to us and wanting to learn about self-storage had my story. You know, they were in the tenant toilet business. They didn't like it and they didn't have the freedom and the cash flow. And so they're looking to get into self-storage. And so 90% of the folks that we teach that get into this have real estate experience. And I would say that's probably about the same for most folks across the landscape uh, of self-storage, period. The other 10%, um, you know, are, are business owners or, you know, they're, they've taken a retirement package and this is their their second go around. They're, 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 uh, retirement before retirement gig and, and they have an understanding of business which helps them but you know I, I think there's no there's no substitute for real estate experience because you're dealing with the same players you know the brokers and sellers and asking the right questions and just you know that that, that experiential experiential knowledge that you only get from doing it in other forms of real estate sure. and then parlaying that into commercial where you know there's a different um, there's a different set of tools that you need to have and resources and, and instead of looking at things and just, you know, one one building and comps in terms of creating value. Now we're looking at, uh, at the business and how can I um, create multiple ways to be able to increase the income and reduce the expenses and looking at it in, in terms of square footage versus just units and, and how do I drive the performance of this. So just a little different mindset, All, you know, not, not rocket science, anything that can be taught, but absolutely coming from you know, real estate, um, you know, takes that experience to get in a little bit and and also to be taken seriously by the bankers. I mean, that's, right. you know, they hold the keys to the kingdom. And if you march sure. in there and say you want to buy a million dollar facility, you know, I have any experience in real estate. And I'm thinking about quitting my job to do this. I'm saying, eh, hold on. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. And one, one so, of the things that we also teach our students is to stay focused because in real estate, there's, you know, literally a million different things that you can get your hands into. And so we we want people to 
focus on one thing, whether that's wholesaling, yeah. whether it's rentals, whether it's flipping, whether it's self storage or whatever, we want mm -hmm. them to pick a lane and focus on it and really hone that skill and get good at it. And mm -hmm. then you can move on. Like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, we've certainly talked about self storage, but we had so many other irons in the fire. And if you go yeah. try to chase all the rabbits that are out there, you're not going to catch any of them. So, yeah. you know, it's something that as we grow, we'll probably add to our oh, sure. portfolio. But well, I'm thinking today. So today of all days, just just two hours ago, we have an Airbnb that's in a great location. They've been good tenants. Mm -hmm. But last night we had water over the floor because they're flushing tampons down the down the toilet. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I mean, you don't. And there, there's signs above every toilet that says, "Don't flush anything beside toilet paper." So you know, I'm, I'm laughing as you're saying there's no tenants. I'm thinking, hmm, well, that's interesting. <laughs> so that was a that was last night on the couch, and and we don't we have we have a great team that manages things for us, but it still reaches us. It's still the yeah yeah it's they still, don't write know, the checks reach, at the end of the day. Like you know? oh, and then you have a little angst to it, and you're like, they're gonna give me a bad review, and mm -hmm. there's all that piece to it and i'm and who's gonna pay for the service call <laughs> so how do you how would you yeah who's gonna pay for the service call right yeah do we charge them so then they get pissed at us and, and uh, that's a bad review yeah mm -hmm. so how how do you compare you have a great perspective because you did both mm -hmm. how would you compare the cash flow in self-storage versus the cash flow in rentals you know i mean yeah. hard to compare apples to apples and you're buying a single house for 150 bucks a month and right. a big unit but i mean Dollar for dollar, effort for effort, cash flow in one versus the other. Yeah, uh, well, of course, you know, any any question that uh, that you ask, I can answer with it depends, and um, it, it does. But you know, yeah. if you look at apples to apples, um, well, first of all, that that also isn't fair because you know, in a single family house, if you have one or two of them, if you lose one tenant, guess what? You've lost 100% of your rent in that property. Right. Whereas if you're buying apartment complex or in our case storage facilities uh, where you have more units, multiple units, you know, if, if you have a 300 unit facility and I lose a couple of tenants, well, guess what? I, you know, I've, I've got 300 still paying uh, enough to pay the mortgage and the utilities and the insurance and everything else. And so, I mean, you know, with economies of scale, you know, comes that that buffer. And so you can you can also make the same argument in, in single family houses. If you own, you know, a whole bunch of those or 100 houses or 200 houses, you know, same thing. Um, the challenge that we ran into when we had 420 of them is that, you know, there was still that high expense of having to turn them over. You know, it's 40, you know, 30 to 45 days to run them through yeah, court, that's true. That's get somebody true. in. That's and we had, true. you know, anywhere from 1200, 1500, maybe $2,000 sometimes in these turns if they really destroyed the place. Whereas now if they move out, uh, we're always marketing with self storage. The website's up, the marketing is in place. We have a budget for it. We're always marketing. Um, and our average tenancy is, is 13 months. Um, but so if one even does come, when one does come uh, available, again, they move out, we blow it out and, you know, we, we move them in. So it's just more constant. Um, we don't get affected by the, the swings in the economy when things are good in this country. You know, we, we have a habit of buying stuff and then we run out of room for stuff. And when things are bad and we head into a recession like we're heading in right now, um, self-storage actually does better and it outperforms yet again you know, all other forms of real estate because businesses are downsizing, individuals are downsizing, moving sure. in with each other, moving back home. And we always have this surge, this rush to storage. And at the same time, the banks, you know, they shut off the faucet for development or the speculative types of projects. And so, you know, that creates a, a, an incredible time for us. And so, you know, we don't celebrate, we certainly don't celebrate pandemics and we don't celebrate recessions. But for those of us that are in the storage industry, we, you know, we kind of secretly are like, okay, here we go, because it, yeah. it, it is, it's our, it's our Super Bowl, and we've been preparing for this one since 2011 when we came out of the last one. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on climate controlled versus not? Yeah, you know, climate control is a beautiful thing. That was um, the the demand for that was created by our friends at the REITs, um, the Real Estate Investment Trust. So the public storages, the U-Haul folks, you know, they they came out. Uh, you know, they realized there's a need for it in some instances, but we we keep it between 55 to 85. Okay, so it doesn't freeze and doesn't boil. Um, most of the junk, I mean, treasures that people are storing in our storage facilities don't need to be in temperature controlled storage, but uh, the REITs have done such a fantastic job of creating a higher demand for that because they can hire, charge higher rent. So, I, but I, I, I use the analogy of like a Ben and Jerry's ice cream where it's just a little bit better and they put, you know, a few more chunks of chocolate chips or whatever in it than the store brand or somebody else, but they charge incrementally higher for that, that premium ice cream. Well, temperature controlled storage is the same. You know, we put an HVAC unit in it to begin with, and we put more insulation in the construction, but we charge this much more across several hundred units, and they are the most profitable side of uh, the business for us. So is it a necessity for everybody's stuff that they're storing? No. Do a lot of folks, most folks want it now? 
Yeah, and that's what the REITs are building. You see, they don't build these single story stuff anymore. You won't see, you know, the the the, the uh, Cube Smarts and the Life Storage and the u haul and the Public Storage and Extra Space with single story drive up units any longer. It's the three and four story gleaming Class A facilities. That's what they're building. Yeah, when you're when you're doing multiples, we don't we've never done any syndication stuff, so I don't know a lot about it. I know enough to be dangerous, but that's about it. So when you're when you are going out there and gonna do gonna buy a new unit. And you mm -hmm. look and say, okay, it's $2 million, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bank will give you, I don't know, like in our world, we get 80% loan to value or whatever. I don't know if there's something like that probably in a calculation there. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to have a, a down payment so the bank knows you have skin in the game. Is that where the down payment comes from, from the people that you raise money from the syndication? The bank's okay with that? They know they know that every, and they yeah. have to know that you have money in the game? Or is this something you can do without having your own skin in the game mm -hmm. by building a business around it? Yeah, yeah. So the answer to all that is yes. Um, okay. So set 75 to 80 percent um, LTV loan typically. And um, the beauty of storage is that the, the SBA, Small Business Administration, they have a loan specifically for self-storage because they do look at it as a business that we can go up to 85 percent. And, oh. and they, they will they're in the business of getting money into the marketplace. And so even new investors can qualify for this SBA loan for a self-storage facility oh. if it's their first one. So high LTV, low rates, and first-time buyers, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's another reason why a lot of people are flocking to self-storage as, as an investment. Um, the, the bank does want to see that you have, whether it's uh, the SBA or any other bank, yeah, they want to see that you have some skin in the game. So it could be five, ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. But then the rest of it is, uh, is the private equity, our partners, when we go up and do a capital raise and um, for the balance of that. And so what we call the capital stack, you know, the bank, it just depends on what they're looking at. If they're going to give you 75% LTV, they may have a stipulation where they want you in a 10%. So that remaining 15% can then be seller financing. It could be private equity. It could be a combination. You could have four layers to that capital stack to get the deal across the finish line. Uh, and But to answer your question for the bank, they're in first position. So if they're, if they're loaning 75%, they don't care where the rest of the cash comes from because sure. if uh, everything goes to heck in a handbasket, everybody gets wiped away anyways and they get the they asset. Get there. Back. And so right. they're, yeah. they're not too concerned except for the fact that they do want you to have some skin in the game because they don't really want it back. And so, uh, you know, if sure. you have a reason to to make this thing work so that you don't lose that along with um, your credit and everything else, you know, that that's where it comes in with their, um, uh, their demand for the down payment and what that percentage is. Yeah. What analytics or data do you use to determine whether an area is too saturated? Yeah, a lot, a lot. Um, the good news is, is that once again, this is not an easy business, but we have a simple and predictable business model. You know, somewhere between six and a half to seven and a half square feet per person is what's called equilibrium in our marketplace. Now, every every individual market um, is is different because there's some demand factors, but when we go into a market, um, we can get a lot of those reports online, and then we'll back it up by boots on the ground, checking the facilities to see if it's if it's an oversupplied market or not. Uh, but in some cases where there's higher demand, uh, college towns, military, um, Florida with no basements or a, a high concentration of apartments or mobile homes where they don't have storage, you know, it could be in that eight or nine square foot per person where, norm, you know, what's normal in our industry, they would say that's oversupplied. But when we get boots on the ground and we check those facilities, they're all full and they have a waiting list. So there's other factors that go into that. So we're, we're going to look into the market. We have uh, data that we can uh, buy. We have data that we do on the ground. And then um, we have feasibility studies. If we're going to develop or convert a facility, we'll have a consultant come in. And um, that's the first step, because regardless of what we think or what we say in front of a bank or our private equity partners, you know, we have to have that third party arm's length uh, study done by a consultant that says that, you know, this thing is either going to work and here's when it begins oh. to cash flow or roughly thereabouts. Um, so we don't we don't build them just for kicks and, and hope that they'll you know somebody will come. Yeah, there's a lot of data that goes on into that. And, and by the way, there's you know, there also there has to be um, a high a high enough rent in that market too. If everybody's at you know 60 cents a, a square foot for rent, you know we could get the land for free and build a building and, and it just wouldn't work. You know it has to right. be at a certain level. And we reverse engineer backwards at 85 percent occupancy when it's stabilized. Here's the amount of money. That it will take a you know to, here's the amount of money that we'll have going into it here's what it takes to run it and if uh, we re reverse engineer it back and it doesn't cover the cost of uh, the land and construction then the, the deal doesn't work so okay uh, a lot of data goes into this before we um you know, oh sure actually hit the green button do you have a question you do you have a price per square footage average to build one including the hvac and the insulation and yeah most most of our single story facilities um, are somewhere around thirty dollars to thirty five dollars a square foot, um, and I'd say all in because it depends on how people price it. So that's excluding the land. 
Um, we can build the buildings for about $30 a square foot, and that doesn't include the concrete. About $35 a square foot includes the concrete pads, the buildings, and, and a fence ar around it. And then, you know, the variables are the office and the security system. So that's that's cheaper than a house. What's that? A little cheaper than a house. Yeah, Thirty-five bucks yeah. a square foot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's pretty interesting. So that's I, that's the single story. The 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 multi-story, the class A, um, anywhere from fifty-five on up to eighty dollars a square foot, depending upon the amenities and everything else. And that again, it does not inc uh, include the the land. So that's um, going to be your climate control type of facilities, though. Oh no, the other ones are climate control too. Like, it depends where you live, right? Can't put it, you couldn't put climate control in New York. Well, I guess you could, but it had to be enclosed, I would think. You can't, yeah, you can. We, we, we also build the, the single story drive up temperature controlled uh, facilities uh, as well. They just have, they have uh, doors facing outside and then doors facing inside with a corridor and a man door in it um, so they can access. Oh, I it. see. Gonna say tough. So, one more question for you on that. Yeah. So, in our business, you know, one thing I kind of like about the single family for us is liquidity. Like down the road, if I want to. So how how would that work with you with liquidity with the store? So you have a facility. Are they easy to get out of? Can you how, what's how can you get cash out of that if you need to or want to or want to step out of the business? Is it easy to sell those or mm -hmm. curious? Um, well, I, I guess you could say fewer buyers, except we don't have any problem selling our facilities. We sell them right. Um, you know, in, in the past few years, we've become kind of merchant developers um, without really setting out to be a merchant developer, which means that even so you sell them too. The yeah, even before we we open the doors, we have uh, the REITs knocking on our door saying, we'll buy it. Hey, before you put your sign up, we'll buy it now. Wait we'll a minute. So you, so you wholesale, so you're essentially wholesaling, mm -hmm. I mean, kind of, I don't know if you're closing first, but you're essentially wholesaling and yeah. you're selling. Are you talking about wholesaling or building new? Well, we, we, oh. we can, we'll build it. And um, before we open it up for business and put the sign on it, you know, we've gone through the process of raising the capital and put the loan on it and everything, but it's uh, interest only. And, and before we begin to lease it up, somebody will come along and, uh, and offer to buy it from us really? and put their sign on it and uh, in, instead. In some instances, we're leasing it up a little bit, uh, but then we also, we find opportunities. I mean, we have a, you know, we've created a pretty big marketing machine. I mean, you kind of have to have one, you know, if yeah. you're operating at any level. And so there's, there's projects and properties that, we don't take down and won't take down for one reason or another, or we just have too many projects. And so, yeah, we can call some of the big guys. And also, um, again, the position that we're in that, you know, um, I'm an influencer or, you know, I write articles and, and teach. And so there's a lot of folks that uh, we have access to that um, we can uh, wholesale our properties off to as well. Last question I want to ask you, then I want to, I want you to tell everybody how they can reach you and find you. So, um, you know, we call this the real estate of mind show, right? And so that's, mm -hmm. we believe strongly that you don't get to a certain level in life till you have your head right. And so mm -hmm. obviously there's no way you've reached level of success without, you know, keeping your mind right and out of, out of the bad negative stuff. And all, you know, you know what I'm talking about. How do mm -hmm. you keep yourself mentally strong with what you've built? Obviously you've been very successful. It's very impressive. I've learned a lot today, but what, what do you do to keep yourself mm -hmm. mentally strong? Uh, part of its DNA, I guess. Um, you know, um, I think uh, those of us that are entrepreneurs, you know, we just we we know, and we're kind of it's a, that's the way we're built, and that's the way we're wired. I mean, uh, you know, God created 33 flavors of ice cream at Bresler's, right? And so uh, He created a whole bunch of flavors of people, and some some folks just uh, have a little more resilience, I guess, and um, you know, flex your risk muscle a little bit more. And uh, I think now it's just coming from a place where um, once I did decide to go into real estate full time, I just realized that I wasn't just I, I wasn't a good employee anyways. I just always knew I had lemonade stand when I was a kid and got my buddy to run it and just never really cared to work for somebody else and, and always knew that I was going to get into this. And so I guess when you have that mindset and you already have a bent towards that, you're going to do whatever it takes to, to make it work. You know, yeah. we also in, in 99, 2000, this will be my third recession um, during that one when the tech bubble you know, burst and, and then we had 9-11. Um, um, the administration at the time came out with the Community Reinvestment Act where they felt that everybody that could fog a mirror should own a house and get a loan. Right. Well, that was, you know, the first domino that led to the 2008 crash because all those folks did. They went out and bought houses and then yep. it crashed. Well, yep. at that time, we had a lot of houses and apartments, and anybody that could fog a mirror was leaving, and and so you know, our cash flow plummeted, and uh, we we almost lost it all. And um, so when you come out of something like that, whether it's large or small, you know, I think that's what kind of builds the resilience of um, saying, yeah, if I had to go back and work for somebody else to to take care of my family, I would, but I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that that uh, that doesn't happen. 
and and then you also just and so then when another one comes around when you know 2008 came around and then and now what we're heading into another recession you know 2008 we were a little bit nervous and um yeah it, it, it was a struggle for a little bit but again we're in this this great sector and we only got caught out because it was so dramatic and the loan stopped and we just had to pivot a little bit yeah, figure it out but figure it out and we did stuff, very though, well on I, the last one you're in a mastermind i know we're in the same one mm -hmm. and you're in a mastermind but you must be i think you're in other masterminds i don't yeah. know if you do any reading at all do you listen to positive podcasts do you i mean what do you do to keep you mean that's what so, anybody can wrap their hands around sure I, I i guess you know so to sort of wrap that up i mean it does come from experience and i think uh, you know we're all cut from a different breed but i think the more that you know and the more you are around other people that are successful you, you just that's kind of infectious and you kind of catch some of that it is and you also look at the worst case scenario you know okay so what if i did lose it all and you know don't be stupid and risk everything you know if you had especially if you have a family but you know if something unforeseen happens what is the worst going to happen you know, we're in the United States of America and we got a great opportunity in front of us no matter what happens. And if I have to live in the basement with my mother-in-law and my kids for a little while, all right, that's the worst right. that can happen. Yeah, I'll go out and build it again. But the worst case scenario and, and you know, yes, lots of books, um, Robert Kiyosaki probably being the first one, you know, you, you want to reduce your, your single source of failure and your single source of failure uh, in terms of income coming into your household is being reliant upon a job and a W-2 from somebody else. You know, if that if that goes away, what are you left with? Well, nothing. And that's what a whole bunch of folks are in a position right now. Well, you know what? We know how to make money and we've been yeah. honing those skills and learning how, and if it isn't real estate, it's something else because we know how to run a business. And so it's all about learning and, and from others and understanding, you know, income producing assets aren't going anywhere. You know, right. a business that, you know, some businesses will get hurt during a recession, some may go under, but if you've got a business that's producing income or an asset that's producing income, then you're going to be shielded from you know what happens as we go through these economic swings. So yeah. I love that line. Your yeah. single source of your single source of failure failure is working for somebody else. Right. <laughs> Very true. I love that. You've also said many times throughout this this <clears throat> interview today that you've invested in yourself, and you mm -hmm. and I are both in the education space. You teach education on self storage. We teach education in our home flipping workshops on how to you know mm -hmm. get into real estate and get started with that and it's so funny every now and again so we'll mark i'm sure you get the same thing people will give you these negative jabs online oh they only make their money selling their courses they're they're a bunch of shit they don't make any that's all they they give you all kinds of crap i laugh, I laugh and think we're the ones that invest in ourselves to get to where we are today mm -hmm. so when you mock people that invest in themselves or say ah they just make money that's how we learn when you bought carlton yeah. sheets we bought carlton sheets we we bought the expanded yeah. five thousand dollar version of carlton sheets the personal mm -hmm. coaching and We've joined masterminds. There are tens of thousands. We've been to Anthony Robbins, $10, 20, 30, $40,000 mm -hmm. for the weekend. And we, we've invested half a million dollars anyways on in ourselves. And you, mm -hmm. I can just tell by talking, same thing. We have to invest in ourselves to get to a certain level in life and learn from others. And mm -hmm. that's not always free. You got to spend some money investing in yourself. It's rarely free. Yeah, rarely. let me take yeah, on that free for, you get for a for. second. Yeah, so if I could, um, same thing. I've, I've got exactly the same amount you do. I've got a half a million dollars in, in my education, um, and that's on top of paying for myself, paying for my college education at the University of Michigan. And I can tell you how many times I've, I've pulled that education out um, to use um, versus what I have uh, uh, in the real estate. <laughs> right. and, right. and, uh, and I'll be honest with you, this, you know, the education side of the business, um, although it, it looked enticing when I told the story of getting into it, but you know, the, the real backstory is that um, when I was broke, and almost ready to go under. That's when I met Dave Ramsey. I started taking his courses and I actually got a chance to meet him uh, backstage several years later after we got ourselves, uh, my, my wife and I, we tithed ourselves out of debt. You know, we paid oh, wow. 10% Great. of our profits back to our church and tithed ourselves out of debt. And I met Dave Ramsey and told him my story, which is the same as his story. We both went broken in, in real estate. He went bankrupt, I came close. And he stopped me and we were backstage talking and he starts poking me in my chest and he says, listen, you need to go out and start teaching people more about this asset class so they don't get into the situation that you and I did on the single family rental side um, and flipping these houses and doing things uh, the wrong way and getting over leveraged um, because now you've got a you, you're doing it the right way and you're doing it with self storage and so that, that it became a really a mission not not my personal mission but this mission was given to my wife and I to go out and, and do this. And um, I'll tell you what there's um, uh, if anybody thinks that we're getting rich off of uh, doing this this all this is is the entryway. To, for me to share this with others, to go out and, and do real estate a different way, add another tool to their tool belt. Yeah. Um, but the, the benefit to me is that if I get a chance to partner with these folks and, and leverage, you know, when I have my resources and our 
all the folks that we have in our back office and our staff and we have bandwidth to, to be able to work with more people, that that's where we make our money. The money is in the bricks and the mortar. It is not in uh, all the you know challenges and issues with the customer service of, uh, of, of running a real estate information business um, because sure. we could stop that today and I, and I wouldn't miss it. Uh, sure. Don't get me wrong, I love to teach people, but if you want to compare apples to apples, there is no uh, comparison um, in terms of you know the, the money that is made because it's really a pass through so that we can do more real estate deals, period. Sure. Sure. Awesome. Well, listen, this has been great today. I I, love, I know Amber and I have talked about self-storage for a long time. So when I heard you were coming on, I said, this is great. I look forward. This has been an awesome interview. Tell everybody how they can reach you, how they can find you, how they can know more about Scott Myers and self-storage. Sure. Yeah. Best way is uh, to go to selfstorageinvesting.com. And uh, that uh, you will find all things self-storage. We have uh, all types of uh, free downloads and um, we've got a, a PDF right now. It's an ebook of uh, the seven mistakes new investors make and uh, how to avoid them because we got a lot of folks looking into self-storage right now as we head into this recession as uh, they always sure. do. So uh, sure. if you're interested, go pull down some of those and um, yeah, check us out. We'll be happy to help you get into the business. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, Scott. well, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Everybody, we'll see you next week. And Scott, thanks thanks so much. And go, you're interested in self-storage, go check it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a great guy. So thanks for being here, Scott. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right, you too. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a review and leave us your questions and comments and we will personally answer and please share it to anyone you think could benefit. You can find us all over social media at Glenn and Amber Schwarm. We'll see you next week.